has inflammation of the gallbladder. We pray that uh, that would be that he would be healed and that it would come through your hand directly or indirectly and it would come about uh, quickly and we pray that you would encourage him in your word as he heals. Father, we pray uh, that you would provide illumination through the word of truth as we continue today in Bible doctrine. We ask this in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. All right. Very quickly, then, I'm going to uh, uh, read from Psychology Today from this particular article online. The ten major defense mechanisms. Uh, number one, projection, attributing one's unacceptable feelings or desires to someone else. For example, if a bully constantly ridicules a peer about insecurities, the bully might be projecting his own struggle with self-esteem onto the other person. Denial, refusing to recognize or acknowledge, acknowledge real facts or experiences that would lead to anxiety. Repression, blocking difficult thoughts from entering into consciousness, such as a trauma survivor shutting out a tragic experience. Regression, reverting to the behavior or emotions of an earlier developmental spa stage. Rationalization, justifying a mistake or problematic feeling when seeming, seemingly logical reasons, or, or let's try that again, rationalization, justifying a mistake or problematic feeling with seemingly logical reasons or explanations. Displacement, redirecting an emotional reaction from the rightful recipient to another person. For example, if a manager screams at an employee, the employee doesn't scream back, but the employee may yell at uh, her partner later that night. Reaction formation, behaving or expressing the opposite of one's true feelings. For instance, a man who feels insecure about his masculinity might act uh, overly aggressive. Sublimation, channeling sexual unacceptable urges into a productive outlet such as work or a hobby. Intellectualization, focusing on the intellectual rather than emotional consequences of the situation. For example, if a roommate unexpectedly moved out, uh, the other person might conduct a detailed financial analysis rather than discussing their hurt feelings. Compartmentalization, separating components of one's life into different categories to prevent conflicting emotions. In Galatians 2, uh, verses 11 and 12, uh, I want you to see something about this last one, regression. 2 uh, Corinthians 2, verse 11 and 12. And the, the definition of regression given by psychology today, reverting to the behavior or emotions of an earlier developmental stage. And by the way, these were reviewed by the psychology today staff. I couldn't find the, uh, the actual author on them. Here's an example of regression reverting to the behavior or emotions of an earlier developmental stage. Galatians 2, verse 11. But when Cephas came to Antioch, this was the Apostle Paul, and this happened after the, account, the, after the Council of Jerusalem. When, but when Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned 
For prior to the coming of certain men from James, he used to eat with the Gentiles, but when they came, he began to withdraw and hold himself aloof, fearing the party of the circumcision. That's regression. And that, that's a, an operation of, uh, it was, Peter didn't think, well, i have been in, uh, I've been operating in that defense mechanism of, of uh, regression. No, he just feared. And uh, so he uh, went back to the safe place, which was the law of Moses, except the law of Moses didn't even forbid uh, eating or drinking with Gentiles. Uh, that, that was uh, rabbinical stuff. That, uh, that, that wasn't even biblical. Now, there were uh, restrictions on association with, with Gentiles, but uh, anyway, we, we don't have to keep on that. But uh, 1 Samuel chapter 15. First Samuel chapter 15. We had some good questions during break time and some good, some good observation uh, in, in some discussion that we don't, uh, you know, we don't establish uh, or we don't take the, uh, we don't take these things from psychologists uh, As the world view, which is going to, how did how did we discuss that? It's going to seek solutions from the world. We we take what uh, can possibly be of some value from the world, like illustrations pastors use all the time from the world, and they can be val valuable. So we take some information from the world and some information recognized by the world and uh, and uh, as Doug pointed out when it's going on all over the, the place uh, for a hundred years and compiled then we have we have some understanding that uh, these things are there is some evidence to back them up that they're real problems but we, then we go to the word of God to solve the problems we don't uh, we don't take what the, the people who came up with the data uh, think are solutions for the problems. Does that kind of get where we, we were going with that? Now, 1 Samuel 15, this is beautiful to me. Uh, then Samuel said to Saul, the Lord sent me to anoint you as king over his people, over Israel. Now therefore listen to the words of the Lord. Thus says the Lord of hosts, I will punish Amalek for what he did to Israel, how he set himself against him on the way while he was coming up from Egypt. Now go and strike Amalek and utterly destroy all that he has and do not spare him, but put to death both man and woman, child and infant, ox and sheep, camel and donkey. I'm not even going to defend that uh, this afternoon because I don't need to. Because that's what God ordered and uh, his orders were disobeyed. Let's go down to verse 8. He captured Agag, the king of the Am Am Amalekites, alive and destroyed all the people with the edge of the sword. But Saul and the people spared Agag, and the, the Agag was the leader, and the best of the sheep, the oxen, the fatlings, the lambs, and all that was good, and were not willing to destroy them utterly, but everything despised and worthless that they utterly destroyed. Then the word of the Lord came to Samuel, saying, I regret 
that I have made Saul king, for he has turned back from me uh, and has not carried out my commands. And Samuel was distressed and cried out to the Lord all night. Samuel rose early in the morning to meet Saul, and it was told Samuel, saying, Saul came to Carmel, and behold, he set up a monument for himself, then turned and proceeded on down to Gilgal. Samuel came to Saul, and Saul said to him, Blessed are you, I have carried out the command of the Lord. He was in denial. He was failing to recognize real facts or experiences uh, that would lead to anxiety. And you see, these are, these mechanisms are, they can be helpful short term to make you feel better, but they're destructive in the long term because they, every one of them fails to stand up against truth or uh, fails to adhere to truth. Verse 14, But Samuel said, What then is this bleating of sheep in my ears and the lowing of the oxen which I hear? Saul said, They have brought them from the Amalekites for the people spared the best of the sheep and oxen to sacrifice to the Lord your God, but the rest we have utterly destroyed. So there we have proje projection. Projection can take on different forms, but here Saul recognizes his unacceptable traits uh, or impulses in someone else to avoid recognizing the traits or impulses in himself. It was Saul and the people. Uh, he blamed the people for the flaws in himself. A and in this case, he was, he was right about the people, but he was the man in charge. So he was responsible. And it was Saul and the people. So he was in denial about that. And uh, he was... Uh, he was projecting the, the, uh, his impulse on others. Now, it, it, to kind of sum this part up, and we're going to see how we, how we do this, that's, the, uh, that's basically the uh, defense mechanism portion of this, but it can be a, a great benefit to see how people who've studied the mind and the emotions uh, the soul from, e even though they may not call it the soul actually, but uh, uh, it, can be, uh, it can be beneficial uh, to see how these people have studied these things from a human perspective, but to bring them right back to the Word and, uh, and detect them in our own personal life and then simply acknowledge them to God to not be condemned by them, to not fret over them, but simply to, to do the right thing now that we may understand ourselves a, li a little bit better and how we have uh, uh, not adhered to the truth quite well. And we so we effectively deal with these things from the grace and truth of the Word of God. All right, we've got 15 minutes. Let's turn to Hebrews chapter 4. That, uh, if that scream is coming across on video, it's not us. Maybe it's the demons. Don't like the word. Hebrews chapter 4. And verse 12.
For the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword and piercing as far as the division of soul and spirit of both joints and marrow and able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. I, I was speaking of Bob theme in the earlier session. He used to cite this verse from the King James Version. Uh, he would just quote it before every teaching session he did. And uh, it was just a matter of procedure with him. And uh, I do want to put a by the way in there. He, I have read even his detractors. And by the way, Wikipedia does include a, a link to his detractors. I don't know if, it, if the link takes you directly to their articles about him or not. I didn't look that far. But even his detractors complimented him on a series that he did. It was either the late 90s or the earlier or the early, uh, the early 90s or the late 80s. Um, but it was on child abuse from the Word of God. And it was fantastic about, the, uh, about causing a child uh, to stumble. And it would be better for that person to, have, uh, to be tied uh, around the neck with a, a millstone and be cast into the sea. He did an excellent session. And before I'm done with, with this whole thing, it's not going to be today, but I'm going to deal with, with a, a bit of that passage uh, because it says a lot. We, we are handing, uh, not us, but uh, as a nation, we're handing our children over to destruction. And, it, and it's amazing how willing parents are to, uh, to give their children over to horrible things. And uh, it, it's just, it's one indication of, of how far we have declined. But I think it's the major indication. Uh, the failure of a society uh, can be detected by what they do to their kids. And it, it's horrible. I mean, I, I'm, uh, I'm just, I'm at a loss for words about it. What parents are willing to do and, and how they look the other way at what the world does to their kids. All right. Hebrews chapter four, I'm gonna read it again. For the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword and piercing as far as the division of soul and spirit of both joints and marrow and able to judge the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. All right, first we've got soul and spirit. Well, first we've got the, uh, we've got the two-edged sword and that's used as a metaphor for the word of God and it pierces and it pierces as far as the division of soul and spirit and uh, soul and spirit divided by the two-edged sword. Soul and spirit are two distinct components of our immaterial essence. Now people are sometimes confused by that because soul is used sometimes in a way that encompasses the entire immaterial uh, nature of man. So, and spirit is used the same way uh, in both the Old Testament and the New Testament. So uh, this causes confusion and, and it has to be uh, determined by context. But we have a clear division of soul and spirit uh, in the New Testament. In Romans 8, verse 16, the Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. In 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 23, it's very clear. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely, and may your spirit and soul and body 
be preserved complete. We have the Greek word pneuma, spirit, suke, soul, soma, body. Three distinct components of man. Unsaved man has two components because the spirit was lost at the fall. The, the, uh, uh, the, the human spirit is actually an interface. It, it's, it's the connection between God and man, the connection for communication between God and man. And uh, to the Bible student and anybody who studies the Bible or takes in Bible doctrine as a Bible student, and uh, to the Bible student, learning the Word of God in a way that is a benefit comes from the Spirit communicating Bible doctrine to the soul and then the Bible doctrine becomes resident in the soul. That's what happened with the Lord Jesus Christ uh, as he grew in wisdom and stature in Luke 2.52 and applied that Bible doctrine right up on through the time he was tested vigorously and addressed Satan uh, under the direction of the Holy Spirit with Bible doctrine applied precisely to each situation. And so in uh, 1 Corinthians 2, verse 14, but a natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, and he cannot understand them because they are spiritually appraised. The, the word translated natural there is actually sukekos, soulish, the soulish man, the soul of a, of a human being who is not yet regenerated, who does not yet possess the, whole, uh, the human spirit. Such a person cannot receive spiritual information, is unable to, is unable to perceive and process spiritual information, but in uh, 1 Corinthians 2, verse 12, we have not received the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is literally from God, and that's the human spirit. It's capitalized in most editions because uh, the translators figured it was the Holy Spirit. The problem is the preposition ek is used out from instead of the way that, instead of the preposition used when the Holy Spirit is sent from beside God in the Gospel of John, para, beside God. Uh, and so the Spirit out from God, God is three persons and the Holy Spirit doesn't come out from God the Father. The Holy Spirit uh, comes from beside the Father. The human spirit comes directly from God into the believing sinner and that person then has the human spirit which uh, has been defined as a separate entity from the soul. And uh, in, um, well, let's see, I, I don't have a, a whole bunch of time left. All right, th so the Word of God then separates the spiritual and soulish parts of man. Why? To expose what the soul is lacking. And if you allow the word of God, if you allow the sword to pierce, you're going to find that it will do that. And sometimes, sometimes what we thought is spiritual is not actually spiritual at all. It's very soulish. Now, what's this joints and marrow stuff? That's always puzzled me. And we have all kinds of commentators. Well, this came out from... Uh, Genesis 15, when, uh, at the renewal of the covenant, 
with Abraham, and he cut the, the pieces as uh, uh, as he was supposed to do. He cut the animal in pieces, and they related to that. And they, we have uh, uh, Major Ian Thomas. He had a take on it. Well, he was one of these uh, higher life uh, guys, and uh, I, I, whatever he had to say about it, I, I passed up. Um, we have what I believe, and I'm just saying, I'm, I'm saying that this isn't the thus saith the Lord, but this is my take on it. We have a figure of speech, and I forget the name of a figure, the figure of speech, and I couldn't pronounce it right if I remembered it. But it, it is a, a figure of speech with, which represents part of something as the whole. We have that in Ephesians 6, verse 12. But our struggle is not against flesh and blood. Those are only two components of the human being. So, but it stands for the human being. Well, in this case, we've had the, the soul and the spirit uh, recognized. In this case, we have the joints and marrow. And this is a figure of speech which I believe just represents the entire physical being. The parts represent the entire body and that's very important because that's where the sin nature resides and that's from which the sin nature expresses itself and the double-edged sword is able to get right to the issues of the soul the spirit and the body and the body again is important because it's the residence of the sin nature that's in Romans 7 verse 23 and at least two other places in Romans it's the place where the sin nature resides and expresses itself. And so Ephesians uh, 4 verse 12 teaches us that the Lord knows everything about us right through the spirit, uh, the human spirit, right down into the soul and right down into the body. He knows everything about us uh, right down to the physical body and the lust patterns which arise from the sin nature in Psalm 103, verse 14, for he himself knows our frame or form. He is mindful that we are but dust. What was the physical essence of man created from? The dust of the ground. And he knows us that well. And that can be, we can get a little bit comfortable about that because he doesn't, uh, he doesn't hold back from the piercing of everything. He lays it bare, and that's that's good for us. We just don't like it. It uh, it hurts, but it, it is for our benefit. We may get into that from Hebrews chapter twelve. Not now because uh, it's two thirty. But we we'll close by saying this: the Lord does not pamper the sin nature and he does not pamper our twisted thought and emotion which arises from the soul the, the word of God that two edged sword gets right in there gets right at it doesn't mess around lightning speed and accuracy let's close with prayer Father, thank you for our session today, and uh, we thank you for the blessings you bestow on us. We thank you that this, in this day and age of depravity and the grip of evil, we still have some men who stand up, women too, but as, as for communicators of uh, uh, communicators to local assemblies. We have some men who stand up and declare the truth without fear. We thank you for that. We thank you for every one of them. There are more than we even know in pulpits who are, are upright and stick with the truth. Thank you for that, Lord. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.